Move on quickly, um, Howard set the context, but we also know this is a complex market environment in which to be addressing those consumer issues. So I'm going to move on now to our next speaker, Jason Brogdon, who's going to address some of those questions. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. And uh, I, I have had a massive Rory McElroy moment this morning as I was uh, sat in my hotel room doing email and uh, got a text and suddenly realized I was an hour out of sync. So um, uh, thank you for Howard. And uh, I, I'm here, unfortunately, um, a little later than expected, but I was able to pick up on what some of the things that Howard said. I'd, I'd like to just pick up on a couple of things that Howard said before um, I run into my, my standard slide deck. Because I think it was really important, some of the messages that he was getting across. Personalized messages, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. The need for consumer engagement, I completely agree with that. I think that um, coming from the UK market, it's easy for me to sit here and think, how, how do we do that? Because in my day job, I represent the um, largest energy suppliers in the UK. So in a, in a GB model, it's the suppliers, it's the energy retailers who have that engagement with consumers, who are able to engage with products and services. It's not a regulated, network-driven smart meter rollout. So I think one of the things that I want to get across in my presentation today is just get across the importance of taking the breadth of engagement for, for me, demand side today, but more generally, smart metering and consumer engagement. If we don't have the retailers, um, given that we've got the, the split from, from the European regulation now, if we don't get the retailers involved in this, we run the danger of not getting consumers engaged and of not delivering the benefits of smart metering and smart grid going forwards. If you don't engage consumers, then you miss the benefits for me. So if I want to give a message right at the beginning of my presentation without covering any of my material at all, it's listen to Howard listen to the importance of consumer engagement, and don't forget the retailers and the energy suppliers' role in that. Because otherwise, we run the risk of smart metering, smart grids, being a regulated, network-driven rollout, very dull, no consumer engagement. No. We need to engage consumers to make the case for smart metering and smart grids going forwards. So, I am unashamedly going to sit here and make the case for consumer engagement and the retailer's side, but without that, we don't make the case. If we don't engage all of you, if we don't engage consumers generally, then we miss the business case for smart metering and smart grids. Bit off, bit off message, but uh, I just wanted to pick up on what Howard said to begin with, and I'm, I'm very pl I'll be looking forward to reading his research when it comes out. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about what we mean by demand response. I'm going to talk about who wants it and why. Again, you know, does, does it feed into this consumer message? And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can facilitate demand response. Because I don't think it's as simple as some of these network-driven, DSO-driven models that are coming out of Europe. I think you need to engage more widely. I think you need to take into account some of this as some of the European regulation around disseminating supply and, and, and networks. And I, and I think you need to take into account some of the aggregators and some of the third parties that are coming into our market. We must take into account competitive market forces. So um, Engage Consulting, I'm here from Engage Consulting. I'm one of our principals. I'm not going to run through a sales pitch for us. I'm going to leave this slide up here. But we're a specialist subject matter expertise consulting practice in the UK, but also we do work um, in Europe. We've done work um, with Howard both in, in the UK and in Europe. Um, and we have, a particular, um, uh, we have a particular focus on smart metering and smart grids. I've been working on smart metering for six years now and counting, um, and a number of my colleagues have been doing the same. So I'm not going to cover um, the, the sales pitch but um, just to give you a feel for our credibility and what we're doing. On my day-to-day -day basis, I work as the program manager for um, smart metering for the largest six energy retailers in the UK through Energy UK. So that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And part of what we've been doing 
is developing this demand response uh, work in, in G-Beam. And so I'm going to talk uh, a lot today about what we've done for GB, but I, I think it's worth noting uh, there's a lot of disparate initiatives across Europe on demand-side response and demand-side management at the moment. We, we've facilitated discussions in GB between retailers, network operators, transmission and um, system operators. But there is the European Demand Connection Code, and uh, I'm aware of some of the feedback that's come back from that, um, including from ESMIC, amongst others, um, about the need to take a, a wider view on, uh, on connection. There are work on DSO models in Europe through Euroelectric, ASEM, CER. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit today about what is needed to facilitate demand response, and I'm going to call on GB. If we can make it work in GB with the model and the market model that we have in, in Great Britain, then we should be able to make it work anywhere. So what do I mean by demand response? I, li I like pictures. I'm not very good at drawing them, but I do like pictures. So I'm unashamedly going to steal one of my colleagues' pictures. Demand response is not about energy reduction. It's not about energy saving. It's about peak management. It's about saving the investment in networks associated with reducing peak. It's about saving money for suppliers and therefore consumers in reducing peak in the wholesale market. So we shouldn't confuse demand response with energy savings. It's all about reducing that peak. So you can do that by shifting it to the right, taking it out of peak periods. You can do it by physically reducing it. Actually, I love the middle picture. You can do it by increasing demand if you've got a lot of wind blowing. It's all about matching generation to demand and getting the right profile. So let's make sure that, that we understand what demand response is first before we talk about how we execute it. It's not energy efficiency. It's about managing peak. It's about matching demand to generation. The drivers that we have in, in Great Britain are, are very, very diverse. Key message for today, this is not just a distribution system operator issue. This is about how you deliver government policy, and it's about how you engage the different the different drivers and the dis different participants in the market to deliver that government energy policy. And yes, for transmission system, and we have a very active demand response market in GB. We have short-term operating reserve. We have some um, contracts with, that's not me, I promise. <laughs> Magnetic impact. Um, we, we have a lot of this in place at the moment, um, but at the high level, at the major energy consumers level. We haven't got it at, at the micro level. So yes, it is about transmission system operator. It is about distri distribution system operator. But very importantly, it is also, also about the retail market. We have a very active demand side response retail market in GB. We have time of use tariffs. They've been used for years. I'm on an economy seven tariff. Okay, so this means that it's three times cheaper for me to consume energy in the evening. So I, I put my dishwasher on a timer that goes on at night. Um, I, having three kids, unfortunately the washing machine doesn't always go on at night, but it is a driver for electricity supplies. This is demand side response. This is a mechanism to deliver peak shifting. So um, time of use tariffs is, is, is a key one. And for suppliers, it's all about effective wholesale market purchasing. If they can purchase energy outside peak windows, it's cheaper. And that drives products and services to customers. So again, leading back to Howard's points uh, at the beginning, let's not forget the customer. If we engage the customer, that's the holy grail. We do not want to be automating. We do not want to be imposing demand side response on consumers. Consumers don't want to feel like they're having that imposed upon them. We need to sell it to them. We need to say, here's the product and service. This is what you need to do in order to save money. Or as Howard said, the small percentage that uh, react to environmental issues. This is what you need to do to save the planet. 
There's a hell of a lot of consumer profiling being done by energy retailers, energy suppliers at the moment. They know their customers. They are the key touch point to customers. It's not the network operators. Let's not forget business separation here. Energy suppliers, energy retailers have the touch point with customers. They can make this happen. And let's not forget the last bullet point in that, aggregators. We're beginning to see the aggregators come into the market in the UK. If you get, at a macro level, a large group of consumers engaged for demand-side response, suddenly you can start playing in the balancing mechanism. Suddenly you can start playing with some of these market operations for transmission system balancing. And so they are extremely important, and they will be more important across Europe, across um, worldwide, where they can support their own customer products and their own services and differentiate in that way. And they will make money through system balancing activities. There is money to be made in the same way there is for electricity suppliers and efficient purchasing of wholesale energy, there is for aggregators in making that case as well. It's not just about delivering a distribution system operator market. And I think that is a really important point to make and uh, one that we're, we're doing through Euroelectric and others. This isn't just about DSOs imposing action in order to protect security of supply. Sure, that is an extremely important and necessary way to protect security of supply for consumers. We can do it in different ways. It's much better to engage consumers through products and services, through things that they're opting into, the things that they want in order to deliver demand response. I've probably killed all of my time on uh, my intro and my first two slides. I'll do my best. So I think I'm hoping that I'm speaking to an informed audience here, and most of you know about the benefits of demand response. Yes, it's about customer choice. Yes, it's about security of supply. Yes, it's about managing that peak. Um, but it is also about facilitating cleaner and renewable energy as we go forwards. Um, once more renewable energy, less reliable energy is connected to the grid, and I'm not going to get dialed into the whole smart grid debate, we need to ensure that we take an holistic approach to demand response in order to deliver the most efficient um, uh, energy supplies to consumers. I'll let you run through those bullets there. So what have we done in GB to think about how we might deliver this in our market? Um, and what we, have, what we haven't done is we haven't solutioneered. I'm a consultant. I must use words like this. We haven't gone straight to a solution. What we've done is we've thought about, well, what are the issues and how might this be facilitated? So what we've done is we've defined functions rather than who does them. You won't see me standing here and saying, you won't see me standing here and saying distribution system operator. That might be the answer, but that's not the right market model. What we need to do is step back and ensure that we're making sure that the markets work, then we can think about how we best facilitate that and who's the best people to deliver it. And really importantly, um, is there an evolutionary path? I don't think that now there is a choice around, well, how do we deal with demand side? I think that we have a path that we can follow. I think there are a series of steps that you can take. And I don't think it's a simple choice now about market reform. I think there's a lot of cost-benefit work that needs to be done. But I think there's an evolutionary path that can be taken. So in GB, this is what our market looks like, if you can visualize this for a moment. We have the consumers on the left. We have DSOs, TSOs, suppliers and aggregators, everyone playing in the demand side market at the moment. As I said earlier, we have a very active transmission system operator market for demand side management. We have suppliers who have time of use tariffs. We have a radio teleswitch um, uh, uh, um, market in the UK where um, customers are automatically switched between time of use tariffs. And we have distributors who are starting to strike contracts with major consumers for demand side management at point of connection. And that is a bit of a new thing in GB. And I think we'll see more of this across Europe. Network operators taking the opportunity when they connect customers to enter into contracts for demand side manage management, whether it's interruptible supplies, whether it is scaling back demand at peak times, we are seeing that start to happen. And if you have that, 
happening in the plant, and, and we're seeing aggregators come through. And if you have that happening, look at all those arrows. No one knows the hell what is going on. You've got a supplier who's got a contract with a customer to say, I've got a time of use tariff, or I've got an interruptible supply. You've got an aggregator who's got a contract with a customer saying, well, if you give me your megawatts in a certain period, if you let me cut you off in a certain period, then I will give you these benefits. You've got DSO saying the same. And the TSO also has the same for short-term operating reserve. So you have the potential for all of these different parties taking action. Actually, they don't know what contracts are being struck with the customer between each other. They can be striking contracts for the same period for the same demand. And they don't know. So if I'm a supplier, I might be going to my customer and saying, well, I'd like you to, um, to I'd, I'd like to invoke my interruptible supply for this two hour period. And actually your customer might say, yeah, great. But actually they've already invoked that through their DSO contract. You can't win twice. And that supplier is already balancing and purchasing that energy in the wholesale market. So we have, the, we have the, the, the issue here where you have multiple parties calling on the same energy at the same time for different purposes and for that being used and, and not used in the energy balancing and demand side response market. So how does that work? If I'm a supplier, I'm purchasing energy on the basis of my demand forecasts. If a network operator has taken away that demand through no control of my own, how do I manage that? How do I purchase for that on the wholesale market? I can't. So I'm going to be penalized in my imbalance market because of action out with my control. Now that's not a good place to be. That costs money. So what we've looked at in GB is, well, how might we help this? And transparency of demand side action is one of the things that, that we think can help. So if there is some transparency about, around demand side activity, then suppliers can understand what they need to purchase in the wholesale market. Network operators can understand what's being done by suppliers before they take network operation activity. TSOs can understand the hierarchy of, of call-off. And so the first step is around transparency of information. This is not an easy step to take. There is a lot of commercial sensitivity around these contracts being struck with customers. So we should not underestimate the um, challenges in, 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 in delivering this through regulatory reform. So, so if the first step is transparency, the second step is around having some market operation function. And again, I said at the beginning, I'm not going to talk about distribution system operation. I'm going to talk about a function that is demand response market operation. Because I don't think it ne naturally or necessarily sits with a, with, with a distribution system operator. It might do. That might be the right answer. Because the distribution system operator is the only person who understands the total demand on, on, on their network. They're the only people who can take an holistic picture on it. But it might be that you can give that to a third party. In the UK, we have um, Elexon, who look, after, um, who look after the balancing mechanism. You could have a similar balancing type mechanism for demand response um, across Europe. It might be that sits with distribution system operators. It might be that you give it to a third party. I don't want to prejudge that. And I think a lot of the work that's being done in Europe prejudges that's given to the distribution system operator. I'd like to see it as a function. I'd like to see that as a function that is operated as a market. But importantly, this isn't something that needs a decision now. What I've got up here, and I, I apologize because you probably can't see any of the writing at the back there, but what I'm trying to set out there is an evolutionary path. So we have today on the left-hand side, and we have tomorrow on the right. We have a number of initiatives that are happening through the time. Smart metering, smart grid, renewable generation, micro-generation electric vehicles. There's, there's a series of activities and penetration of 
smart grid and consumer um, activity over time. And what I'm saying along the bottom is we don't need to make a decision about how we deal with demand-side response now. What we need to do is we need to see how those pan out over time and we need to make a cost-benefit case for market reform at the appropriate time. I don't think that's now, but I do think the sooner you think about it, the better informed you'll be when it comes to that market reform decision. And what we've done in the work we've done in GB is we've set out a discussion paper that hopefully sets the framework for that cost-benefit analysis and um, discussion going forward. So don't think it's a binary decision now. DSO or, or, or bust, it's not. It's a market reform. It's an evolution. So just to sum up, um, we can see where the benefits are, I think, Speaking to an informed audience, you know where the benefits are. What I would say is there are opportunities to do this. I think that we need to have an open mind out as to how they're best done, and we need to make the cost-benefit case at the appropriate time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. And all our speakers have got a lot they can say, and hopefully you'll take the chance to talk to them over coffee and in the QA session to, to deal down. Thanks for broadening the, the conversation there and that key part of, of, of the broader market picture. We're now even going to broaden the conversation slightly further um, with a slightly different accent as well. Um, as already discussed, um, this is a global phenomenon, and I'm really pleased to have Yolanda Stringer here uh, to talk to us about the experience they've had in looking at these issues in Australia. Thank you, Yolanda. <laughs> 